Thank you all for being here on this really windy night. It's not nice outside. So this is a, a, the saga of our Second Avenue, si Second Avenue subway signage program. Uh, we've designed many, many signage programs over the years. This is just a kind of sampling of, of the projects that we've worked on. And Doug is right. Uh, we did write the book on signage and wayfinding design. It's a process-oriented book, and it's become kind of the Bible for anybody who works in this field. Um, I have some cards here, if you're interested, that uh, give the information on the book. Buy it on Amazon, not from Wiley. Uh, Amazon's always cheaper. OK, Dave. So. <clears throat> Can you hear me without the microphone? Yes. Sir. Okay, good. Um, a number of years ago, Chris developed a, a process approach for environmental graphic design or signage. And it, we call it the signage pyramid because it's a pyramid. Um, but it has three components. There's an a information component, uh, which forms the basis of the signage program, much like any other publication. Or, or website, it's content first, you know, what do we want to say? And then you figure out the graphics, you know, the colors, the typefaces, et cetera. And in our particular case, it then comes to the hardware. In other words, what are you building? What are you making this stuff out of? Because, you know, you can, you know, it has to be built. So just real simple examples of, of information and graphics and hardware, it's, it's really, what do you want to say? It's basically type you know, ferries, bus stations, whatever, your fonts, your colors, your symbols, and then whatever the structure is that actually displays the, the sign content. We call it design thinking these days. It's a, it's a very straightforward process, but it deals in our business because we deal with the built environment and we're dealing with architects, and engineers, and developers. It's a more programmatic, a little bit more uh, systematic approach where you have pre-design and design and, and then schematic design and so on and so forth. And you, you have to do documentation so people can put in a price on it and build it. So it's a little bit more uh, in, involved. Um, and also, signage is only a subset of wayfinding. You know, if you put a bright light on a front door of a building, that's a cue that that's a safer entrance in which to go, and it means it's the front door. You don't need a sign that says front door. You can turn on the light. So there's a lot of, you know, just environmental cues that are already, that, you know, that become part of the wayfinding program. And, and no amount of signage can really help a badly designed environment. They can help, but they can't fix it. Right. We can point out how bad it is. Um, signage and wayfinding design, of course, is um, there's it's we we some it's a hybrid of, of d disciplines. Obviously, there's graphic design, but then you have to have an understanding of architecture and three-dimensional spaces and how people move through the space. You have to know a little bit about industrial design and interior design, so that you know about materials and processes and manufacturing techniques. Plus, there's a whole bunch of other things that come into play. For example, we've worked on a project in Asia where we had to have everything reviewed by the feng shui master so that you know, we didn't use the wrong pointy shapes or we didn't use the wrong colors that you know, make sure they face the right way, et cetera. So a lot of this comes into play when you're dealing with the environment. And it takes a lot of patience. Yeah, it's not. It's not like designing a website. It's not instant gratification. It's a short project for us is about four years, or an average length. Okay, a short project is maybe about twelve months. Well, this but, one's like fourteen years. Yeah, this is fourteen <laughs> years. So, for those of you who don't know a little bit about the subway, a little bit of history here. Um, originally, the the subway was built privately. There was the BMT, which stood for the stands for the Brooklyn Manhattan Transfer, the IRT line, which stands for the Interborough Rapid Transit, and the IND line, which was stands for the Independent Line. But that was built by the city to be in direct competition to the private enterprises. It was also built a little later. You can almost tell from the type used in the mosaics. 
the independent is kind of no nonsense, very institutional sans serif. Uh, the IRT probably has the most beautiful letter forms, but you'll really notice it, when you go into stations, take a look at the mosaics. You can kind of get a clue as to which subway line um, the, it, the station originally was part of. So the, and early on, there was another line called the Manhattan Main Line which predates the IRT and the BMT and the IND, and it ran roughly from around Madison Square up to 34th Street, across 42nd Street, and then up into Harlem along Broadway. That was purchased by the IRT line in like 1910 and incorporated into the IRT. In about 1940, the, or about 1932, the IND, the city, purchased the other two private lines and formed the New York City subway system, and about 1952, it became the New York City Transit Authority, all operating under one um, umbrella. Keep, now, there keep. were obviously some overlaps between, and this still exists, as you can tell, this was this is one of those electronic displays that you see, but we still have the 8th Avenue IND line. There were other cues, too, like the uh, railings on these sidewalk surrounds. They were kind of unique to each different uh, transit line. And there, did, there were also different things. This is what is called a sidewalk cut entrance, but there are other entrances. There's ones that are inside of buildings, such as up at Rockefeller Center. And then there are others is, uh, that are the elevated platforms. So there's several different kinds of conditions. And the reason I bring this up is because it all plays into how signage is applied. And don't forget. The hmm? co contemporary signage. Yes. The black. The black. That's what I said. This is a, a mix between the old and the new because the, you can see the current system in place along with the previous. This is what it used to look like. Okay. I love the turn sharp left. Okay. It's kind of, kind of cool, really. Nice graphic. But this is clear as can be. You know, this guy here, yeah, uptown, downtown, in town, Interboro, Rapid Transit, IRT, BMT, ABC. And you know. we moved here in 1980, and some of this old signage was still up. They were just implementing the Unimark system. So it was super confusing. Now, this is the same station, several this decades apart. Yeah. So you get an idea of this was really a mess at a time. So. Then clarity. clarity arrives. Unimark, Massimo Vignelli and Bob Norda in particular, took this mess and cleaned it up with a very simple approach to typography. Put together a graphic standards manual. This is the original version. You can now buy a um, reprint. reprint. <laughs> But I want you to pay just pay a little bit of attention to the diagram on the left there. Your left, yes. <laughs> Your left, my left. Your right, <laughs> that side. <laughs> just pay attention to that. <laughs> okay. Um, other curious things: the original typeface for these, these, this Vignelli, I call it the Vignelli system or the Unimark system, was standard. Okay. But I also wanted you to pay attention to what became known as the bullets. This was all part of the introducing how do you res respond, how do you identify the lines. Notice there's a A, a double A, a B, a C, C, a D, an E, an F. There's a, an L, L, a K, K. I haven't seen any of these in quite some time. Okay. They were there, though. They were there. So this was how it was beginning to identify. This was a breakthrough in identification. The original... <coughs> proposal was black type on a white background. And the black uh, bar that you see at the top was the Unimark mounting material, the it's mounting not, structure. It, it was painted black. It's not a graphic element. Okay. So this was the proposal, and it was done in modules. <coughs> and they, they were actually expressed with lines. The modules were individuals. They were expressed with vertical rules. There was an introduction of color, and you can see they proposed a line map on the subway 
platform edge sides. Very schematic, by the way. Yes. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is uh, the way it was originally proposed. There were some examples of it that were actually installed. Then it was changed. And the myth is that it was changed because white will get dirty in the subway. Okay. Well, yeah, of course it's going to get dirty. Everything gets dirty in the subway. Okay. But what the reality of it was is it was better legibility and low light. Is that the white on the black background was more visible, more readable than the white or the black type on the white background, especially in low light conditions. And if you think about it for a minute, you go, oh, okay. Environmental graphic design at this point begins to incorporate visibility, readability, and lighting. Identity crisis, okay. You know, it's weird. Just about every transit system, metro system in the world has a logo of sorts. And here's just a sampling of a few of them. We feel left out. We are logoless. <laughs> you know, and, and they're expressed through signage, uh, in some cases really brilliantly, like the London Underground signs uh, for their station entrances uh, that you see on the upper left. The T in, in Boston, which is right below <laughs> it. Um, the MTR or MRT in Hong Kong which is the upper left, that symbol is everywhere. And even if you don't read Chinese, you, you, go, you know that's a subway station. And then the M for Metro in DC. Now, in New York, um, somehow the globe is thought of as being the, the, the logo. For they the stay. stations. They're on a lot of stations, and there's a version of the round ones, the, some square ones, and some two-tone ones that we're not quite sure exactly what those mean. But, I mean, it, it harkens back to the uh, openness of token booths, and it was way before Metro cards and all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of an archaic signaling device. If you understood the system of red globes, yellow globes and green globes, it meant that certain stations were open or entrances were closed, or that the yellow ones meant they were open sometime, and the green ones said you could get in any time. But, you know, the only one that, that's got any kind of graphic element to it is, is the one that you see in the middle there with the M uh, that kind of identified the Metropolitan Transit Authority, kind of. And then you begin to realize that these globes began to influence the Norda and Vignelli system with the introduction of what were called bullets, which are the circles with the numbers and letters in it. So basically what happened ultimately is what's become emblematic or iconic of the system, but the bullets, not the globes. This is because there is no logo, There's like no the logo. London Underground logos. You can buy T-shirts with them on and all kinds of stuff. But you cannot buy a logo T-shirt or souvenir for the subway system. This is subway or something. So, you know, it's inspired posters. What's kind of interesting about this poster is the fact that uh, there are bullets or circles around all the letters that are currently used in the subway system. So the ones that don't have a circle are not being currently used. So the bullets, by default, kind of become the identifier for the subway. So if we have a logo, it's... It's these bullets. things. It even has been so iconic that it's been adapted and adopted to say, we got a transit alert. I think this is from that newspaper, AM, AM New York. And, and they didn't even use Helvetica as a typeface. They use, it looks like Frutiger to me. So even that there, you can, this is, if you want to buy a souvenir t-shirt of the subway system, you buy something with a bullet on it, okay? So, and that's become, in many ways, the logo of the New York City subway system. It's, it's a, when is a logo not a logo? It, that's what it is. Yeah. So Unimark's standards were rewritten in 2004. Oh, oh several revisions, actually. Right. 
The one we used on Second Avenue was 2004 revision. Now, I, t I recall you wanted to look at this diagram. This diagram has not essentially changed from the original 70s edition, primarily because the stations haven't changed. We haven't built any new ones. They're all the same ones that were around uh, starting in 1910. And basically what that shows is kind of the flow of people and where you need to put signs at decision points. So and there's your three types of entrances. There's your sidewalk cut, your building entrance, and your elevated entrance. And they all look a little different. Still uses the modular system. It's just not expressed anymore. Uh, the, the 2004 manual shows Helvetica medium as a typeface. That's significant, too, and we'll get back to that changed, later. At, at that point, the typeface had changed from standard to Helvetica. Everything's on a module uh, as far as uh, spacing of uh, line spacing of letter forms, et cetera. They've got really tight line spacing in practice, and I think sometimes the descenders uh, fall off the bottom of the signs. And there's a reason for that. It's because there's not a lot of ceiling height in a lot of the stations. So when you need to put two or three lines of type along the edge of a platform and you don't want somebody running into the sign with their head, or in some of the entrances, which only have like maybe eight and a half foot clearances, you have to squeeze that line space. Not only that, you're required to by the Americans with Disabilities Act. You have to have a clearance of at least 80 inches. So in some cases, we don't have that in some ways, but there's a reason behind all of these decisions <laughs> of the tight letter spacing, for example. It's very tight. It's because you're trying to fit 10 pounds of content into a five pound graphic bag. And, okay. and the, the arrow has remained basically unchanged since the uh, Unimark original man, manual. Um, information in the, the current manual, and, and there was always, uh, about the graphic elements, the Pantone color for the circles, uh, et cetera, et cetera, which you see in this chart. And you will notice as well that there is no longer any A, A, E, E, C, C trains. But, but there now, are the mysterious diamonds. The mysterious diamonds appeared <laughs> in the 2004 edition. And I never you, could figure those yeah, out. If you can remember what those are, they're basically express transit stops. They're express stations where you can change between trains. And it happens. Some of you may remember a, a line in this subway called, the, it was probably in the 90s, it was the number nine train, okay? And then it was combined on the number one train, and it was the one nine, and the nine was a, something called a skip stop, where right. it skip stop at <coughs> certain peak times of the day as a partial express train on the local line. So it was the most confusing thing ever, and it didn't last very long. Um, again, getting into design layouts, uh, kind of standardized layouts. Uh, getting into sign mounting on the left-hand side, uh, how where signs get positioned along the track on the platform, and also how many hangers to use. That's on the right side um, for various lengths of signs. So that was something that we had to, to deal with very definitely. So. Second Avenue Subway comes along, and it was such a long project. We talked about patience and long projects. The entire, the, the top image is of, well, the, the you know, Second Avenue Subway project had a logo, but the subway never had a logo. Right? Um, <laughs> it's weird. And so the project logo remained the same, but the design team changed to the point where the DMJM stood for Daniels Johnson, Daniels, Oh, for good. I can't remember. Daniels, Daniels Mann, Johnson, and Mendenhall. Dim Jim for short. And Harris. And Harris. And it was bought out by ACOM later during the process. So there was a change of engineering firms. There was a change of architects. So we're trying to design as the building, as the subway is evolving. You know, I kind of thank God for those standards because it grounded us in the design. But it was kind of interesting uh, when we went down to do an interview with the group. They had really groovy offices. They were way downtown. Um, and I'm going, what, 
house. Uh, the engineering firm has these really <laughs> nice offices. They moved into a failed dot com. <laughs> it was really nice, complete with the coffee machine and the ping pong table, et cetera. Oh yeah, it was really cool. So we, a lot of, you know, sometimes people ask us, well, how did you get this job? Okay, you know, because, you know, you know full well it's going to be kind of a long job. So we picked out a few slides from our pitch. Okay, so here we incorporate the bullets as part of our pitch to the engineering firm. Okay, so... Engineers love this kind of stuff. They love this stuff. <laughs> so we, we told them we had been in a lot of subways, and this is just a, a list of some of the subways <coughs> we had been in at that point. So we, you know, this wasn't our first ride on a subway train. So, and... Um, Defining the subway experience, what is, what, what's involved, uh, step one is entering at street level, then you pay at fare control. Uh, you navigate through some sort of a passageway usually, then you wait at the platform, then you ride, and then you exit or transfer. And each one of those steps has a little bit different content, okay? What do you need when you first <coughs> go to that sidewalk cut? Is this the right train? That's the first thing you want to know. Am I going uptown or downtown? So that's different information than when you get off the train. You don't care. You just want to get off the platform. So. And then uh, approaches that we saw at that time for uh, SAS graphics and hardware. One was to build, uh, option one was to build on the existing design equity in, in the standards. Uh, <laughs> we thought we could update and humanize through background color, shading, and line color. Or, and forget option two, complete redesign. But it we wanted to, it was a new subway, we're going, cool man, new sign system. But it, it, it was very effectively argued to us that it's part of a bigger system. Maybe new stations, but it's part of a bigger system and you must have cohesiveness in the graphics throughout. So, <coughs> so this, this is the slide that nailed the job for us. This last slide left people speechless. <laughs> Should I do that again? <laughs> they were speechless. When you say the second half, the New York City Transit is the subway with balls. <laughs> to a bunch of engineers, it, it's, it, it was effective. Yeah. So I think we, we nailed it. Okay. You know, it was a little bit of a gamble, but we thought, what the hell? What are we going to do? Let's go for it. No. Getting started. Um, you know, I don't know if you know much about Second Avenue Subway, but I think they first <coughs> started it. You, you go ahead. I think they first started uh, contemplating the subway probably <laughs> in the 40s. There was some work done in the 50s, some planning. There was a couple of <coughs> initial tunneling efforts done in the 60s. There was some additional work done in the 70s. This was such an on-again, off-again project that I don't think most people ever knew what the hell was going on with the project. And it all ground to a halt in the 70s. This is the mayor of New York at the time, Abe Beam, holding up a copy of the New York Post where President Ford had told New York City to drop dead. We were at the height of financial crisis uh, that hit New York. We were, you know, the city was kind of bankrupt. It was kind of a crappy place. And we weren't going to get any help, help from D.C. So this is what the, the plan was. It was supposed to go from lower Manhattan all the way up into Harlem. Okay? That's the dream. That's still the plan. Phase one it consists of four stations. It was 63rd, 72nd, 86, and 96. So that's <coughs> what... And basically it's an extension of the Q line. And when it's all built, it'll be called the T line. When it goes all the way from 125th down to Hanover Square. <coughs> it'll get its own bullet. It'll get its own bullet. Right now it's got a shared bullet. So the difference here, one of the big changes, and this, this will tie into a lot of the typography that you see and why typography within the system is exactly what it is. On your right is, you know, it's an existing system, okay, it's existing trains. 
a lot of the, t the system, a lot of the stations were built with these regular series of posts, and the posts were used to put the name of the station, and there's the reason that this, it appears on every other post and not on every post. It's because you need to be able to see the name of the station from anywhere in every subway car when it pulls into the station. Right now, it's a little bit of a, you know, we've all seen this, people are so engaged that, you know, the train pulls out and, boom, you know, they miss the station. On your left is a section through the new 2nd Avenue subway stations. There are no <coughs> columns. So we can't put any signs on any column. Engineering breakthroughs meant that they could build these vaults without columns, which, which is great from a kind of circulation point of view. So there we, we, we were a lot invited in to see some of the study models of the subway. So there was various, you know, here's, you know, the transverse section looking through, you know, here's the mezzanine that you circulate on versus the platform. That was a big change. Get people off of the platform walking around. It's much safer upstairs with no tracks, not a potential of falling into the tracks. It's not as noisy. It's not as hot. Not as dirty. Um, and people. this was all part of our uh, of our effort, which we always do, to gather data and analyze or discover more information about the project. This gives you an idea of, of kind of the feat. This is uh, tunnel boring. Yeah, there were two types of stations. There is what they call cut and cover, where they rip up the street and they put the tracks in and then they cover it back up, or there's tunneling, they're mining. Cave, they do like they drill a big hole. And the machine that you see on the far right. right is a tunnel boring machine. It's made just for this. <laughs> They're custom, but you don't go to like just buy one off the shelf. You know, you have to say, well, I need a tube such diameter, etc. We did a lot of um, research into you know the subways and. <coughs> how they were signed originally. Yeah, so these are existing New York City subway stations. Mm -hmm. And you see that thing on the lower right, which has the subway map? That has to go on every platform in at least two places. All this stuff has names. That's called a customer information display. Okay, they were the, or sometimes they call it SIDS, sometimes I call it SIS. Yeah, I think... Customer information systems and stations? I, I think these were called something different. Yeah, but, they all have names. If you, uh, but the point is we had to, um, you know, kind of, it's a balancing act of where you put signs because you can't put them anywhere you want or anywhere they're necessarily needed. Again, <coughs> going back on our journeys through various subway systems, there's the Chicago up in the upper left. Um, there's the you know, uh, London Underground in the, in, the, in the upper right. There's uh, Hong Kong in the lower left, and uh, Singapore. Singapore. Singapore in the lower right. So it's an interesting combination, which is which you see here. Now, you look at some of these stations, and they're very brightly lit, but a lot of them studios used a white background with a darker letter, unlike our subway stations, which until recently with new platform edge lighting and a higher degree of, of lighting, these would not have worked as well. But I love the way the London Underground uses their, their logo for even, this is the back of a seating element on the platform. They use it in really inventive ways. Examples of, these were some studies that were done early on. Um, there was this was very early in the, the design of the station, so this was, you know, uh, this was a freestanding station, or what you would call a, a sidewalk cut. And but, one thing is that they had escalators. You have to cover up escalators. You can't have open cuts in the sidewalk with that mechanical equipment. So we, we were being bold at this point in the design process. We're going to take these enclosures, and we're going to put the great big word subway on it. And, you know, and, and we wanted to use the bullets really large as the identifier for the entrances as opposed to globes or smaller type. Uh, this got this went about as far as this slide goes. <laughs> this didn't go yeah. Too far. It's uh, I mean we used Helvetica. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
and this was all in what they call the preliminary engineering phase. We're not even at design yet. This is yeah. looking at things. Now here's it's, an example of a building entrance. There are two different kinds. Again, we wanted to use the bullets as kind of the primary you know, identifier and dimensional letters standing on top of canopies to really, we wanted to illuminate them. We wanted to make them different than your standard subway ID sign. So here's a couple renderings at the end of the preliminary engineering phase, which probably lasted about two years. And, um, you know, basically the signs were up on stainless steel posts uh, coming up from the floor or coming down from the ceiling. Here you, whoops. There yeah. you see one coming down from the ceiling. You can also see where we had on the left-hand side that we had Begin, begun to propose line maps or line strip maps. maps. We thought line maps would be really good. Those didn't make it in either. You know, we've never done it before, we're not gonna do it now. So the, the point is that this is a process that's already two years into it and we're still having discussions about content. Oh gosh, that went on until the very end. <laughs> I mean, we started final design about a year after the PE, or preliminary engineering phase, stopped. There was a whole new chief architect, new architects involved in the project. Um, and it all kind of changed quite a bit. <coughs> One of the early stations that we looked at, this is the first, this is the um, southernmost station in the, in the, in the chain. And which was interesting about this is a couple of things. There's this, you know, this is a station that's very deep. If you've ever been to this station, you know how deep underground it is. And the, you know, at least at this point, they were beginning to incorporate wall graphics where you would embed the, the signage into the walls. But they also had this really wacky tube thing going on. Stainless steel, yeah. It was, it was a tube thing, and it had all kind of... And we had to retrofit those with new messages. Now, if you've ever been in that station and you're standing on the side with the orange wall, on the other side of that wall is what you see on the right. It's an existing subway station. Yeah, it was really interesting. I got, we, we toured it. it. We toured the parts that are sealed off to the public, like this other half of the platform. They use it for train storage. Right now, huh. when the train is out of service, they just pull it into a, an abandoned track, and it's two levels. They have an entire entrance uh, that was never opened. They had escalator runs put in, which we ultimately ended up not using. Um, but it was a little bit like going to an ancient pyramid and, you know, opening up the tomb. It was yeah, very interesting. So no rats, either. No rats, which is interesting. Also, coming into play <coughs> graphically as part of the subway system was the Americans with Disabilities Act, which required a combination of, of it was an accessibility issue for people with low vision, so that they could read with touch, if they, they could read the raised letter forms, or if they were a braille reader, they could read the braille. So these began to show up throughout the system. And, but there wasn't much of a standard here. There were some really long horizontal ones, and there were some that were square. Some of them were designed, especially on the, the, the number one train, you'll notice that they, the, little, the square plaques were at the top of the steps, mounted to the railing post, and the railing post is only so wide. Yeah, so, we'll show some more. So you end up having to size the sign to the location as opposed to sizing the sign to the content. I mean, these are relatively small signs, yet they end up being a huge logistical nightmare. Um, and then you see this combination a lot, okay? We've got a sign for sighted people, a sign for people with uh, low visibility. One is upper and lower case, the other is all caps. The letter spacing is different. There's a whole series of typographic requirements that, begin, that come into play as part of transportation graphics. <coughs> and all, all signage, actually. At the time, South Ferry was the brand new station. It was the crown jewel of the subway system. We had gotten rid of that 
Anybody remember the old South Ferry station that you could only fit oh. five cars? Right? Mm -hmm. You could only fit five cars. If you want to get out of South Ferry, please move to the front of the train. And it made such noise that... And it was hot. Hot, hot, hot. Hot, hot, hot. So, Subway, this was great. Look at that. The wonderful suspension system, the graphics, nice clean entrance. It was and then Sandy great. happened. Hurricane Sandy. And totally wiped it out. But here we have, again, you see column-mounted signs. This is not a column-free station. We have suspended signs. We've got plenty of ceiling height. We don't have to worry about the line spacing. We've got plenty of ceiling height. We've got room for bus information. We've got room for bullets. We've got room for exit. We've got room for everything. Uh, fair array signage for getting people out. It's very important. And then there was the introduction of that item on the right. Cut the customer um, assistance intercom, right. which I don't even think they have anymore. Right, now they have those blue help. You know, but things. once again, these kind of, I'll call them secondary signs, ended up being a huge coordination uh, uh, situation. Uh, even on the right, th those are the fire hose signs. You probably never even noticed them. That's left. Okay, I'm dyslexic. Um, you, you probably don't notice them. They're only about six inches square. They're, they're tiny. But, but lo you have to locate them where the fire hose reels are. And so they get in the way of everything. Now and the sign on, on, the, on, the, on the right there, which is area of rescue assistance, this was the bane of our existence during Second Avenue Subway. You can't imagine how tedious the discussions were about four words. Okay. Or three. Because the architects favored the message, area of refuge, and station signage, which is the uh, in-house department at the MTA, they wanted area of rescue assistance. This went on to the very last minute. Yes. We just wanted things to fit, that's all. We didn't care what you said. No, I really don't care. Just make up your mind. So. And again, because the ADA comes into play here, where you have to have certain sites, even for sighted people, you, there's certain size limits on, on letters, it, it, and it varies how, with how high they're mounted. So it gets quite complex very quickly. Now, an aside about type, um, the original Unimark standards had standard medium as a typeface, which is very Helvetica-like, the closest here in the States it, well, standard was the one in the States. Its European equivalent is accidents grotesque. Um, but it eventually evolved into Helvetica medium, to, and that's what's used to this day. Now, one of the things that happened is you're, you're looking at this thing. Don't ever throw this out, okay? Um, this came out from a company called Gerber Scientific Products, okay? Gerber machines allowed that's one on the bottom. Vinyl. You could cut vinyl using a stylus, and you didn't have to make masks by hand anymore. You could cut stencils. You could cut vinyl. But this changed how signs were made. So this comes back to learning about industrial design and techniques of manufacturing. The early machines, I want you to pay attention to the ergonomics of that device. That, <laughs> could you work on that machine at all anymore? It's just like... Uh, it's a, it's it looks a, like a shop project. It's a brick. But this changed how signs began to be made. Because it used to be all you could get was like 72 point type. And then it would have to be blown up either photographically or by hand. And so you, it was difficult to reproduce a typeface faithfully. Then along comes... Helvetica Noye. Helvetica Noye. Throws a wrench into the whole mix. Okay, standard on, on the right, there's the two versions. There's standard medium, which had a pretty close resemblance to Helvetica medium at one time, but then you come in and it introduced Noye. And so basically what you see is the Noye, oops, it has a, a big 
big hook on the lowercase a. That's how you, that's a dead ringer for distinguishing the two. But you begin to look at the weights, and the weights became difficult. To so eliminate. here we have again the, the page from the 2004 type uh, sign manual. It says specifically, if you read above the, the showing of the alphabet, Helvetica medium. Helvetica medium. I actually had to have a meeting with station signage and hold up this sign next to it that said, just plain old, not Noye Helvetica medium has disappeared. It no longer was available. I think it is now. I think Linotype has reissued the original Helvetica and its original medium cut. So we start in, and this is studies, studies and more studies. This is, if you look at this, it's kind of, there's these, we've all seen these, you know, these countdown clocks and these uh, visual paging systems. Do you put it on the left? Do you put it on the right? Do you put it in line with this? Do you put it close to the word exit? Do you center it? All of this comes into play if you think about it. If you're going to bring power and data lines into a sign, do we run it down the middle? Do you run it down the side, et cetera? So we get, to, you know, all of this becomes studies. Here's that area of refuge versus area of rescue assistance. It went on and on and on. They both fit on the side. We didn't care for the layout. These are early studies of how just, we had to do this to make sure that the information fit on the side on the platforms. You, you well, the, the top the top is the mezzanine, and the below is the platform. And you don't generally pay attention to how many signs are actually in a subway station. This wasn't all of it. This was just the preliminary. We had to make sure that signs fit in the wall grid. Early on, if you remember the manual, everything was in 12-inch increments. Well. These wall panels and the tiles are not 12 inch increments. If you want it to blend and look like it belongs there, you generally have to mod or, you know, modify the module. <coughs> so here we were breaking the rules of the sign manual. Uh, at least on the mezzanine we did. Yep. And more studies of, you know, what are our conditions? Do we have a projecting sign or a hanging sign or something that's integrated into the wall. It depends on where it is, what's the room. So we have horizontal, we have square, we have rectangular, we have all of these different layouts. We have stack typography versus inline typography. And, and that could be in the same station just because of the ceiling conditions. So having to accommodate all of this, your content and your location are now driving the graphic layout. Ah, the light at the end of the tunnel. We're finally at final design. We're in like three years into this project and we're just entering final design. <laughs> Every sign had to be drawn in scale to fit on the platform. So, so this sign is a, in scale is exactly how it would be in real life at that scale. Now this is just beginning to look at all of the signs and this is just, this isn't a big chunk of a platform. This is maybe two train cars. What you see on either end, the dotted or dashed lines are match lines, so they match up with the plan, the next plan on either side. So I think there were typically five or six plans sheets for the platforms and three or four for the mezzanines. All the graphic layouts, we, each one had to be documented, dimensioned, and given instructions as how to reproduce it. How would they fit in, do they match the width of the stairwell or are they shorter? And then because we have no columns and no ceilings from which to hang sides, an entirely new suspension system had to be developed. It was all suspended by cables and done in such a way that it could withstand the, we've all felt the, how do you know the train's coming? You could feel the wind. Okay, it's really pushing a lot of air. So it, that sign can't wiggle. If that sign is wiggling and you're standing underneath it, I'm getting out of the way. I don't want to be near it. So cabling system was developed. And what you see on the right is called their customer in information system, which consists of like a neighborhood map, a subway map, a, I think a bus map, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a, 
several components. It takes up a certain amount of size. You can't make it smaller. And in many cases, we had to actually chop them up into, and put them at various locations. So and this has evolved even further in today to what is called in some of the newer platforms, the newer stations, it's called the dashboard. And if you see them, they're, they're pretty nice. You know, they're illuminated. they got a lot of nice information on them. It's the key to the whole program is what we call a sign message schedule. It's a list of every sign. It's keyed to how it's made, where it goes, it's keyed to the architectural drawing, it's keyed to all of the components so that all of the little bits of information along here, if you know how to read this thing, you can figure out where the sign is, which station, what it says, and so on and so forth. They were really fun to proofread. <laughs> We even got to, uh, since we're not engineers, and, and we have to repeat that oftentimes to people, we're not licensed to practice engineering or architecture, we're graphic designers. So we told the architects, okay, you want the cables, you got to engineer it. We like the cables, but I can't tell you the gauge of the cable. Yeah, I can't, I can't tell you, you any of that. I can't tell you where to put them or anything. So the architects did all these drawings of, of mounting details and cabling and this and that. And we had to cross-reference our message schedule. Because we had to tell them how big to make the sign based <coughs> on the message. So every sign is a little different. Okay. No, not really, but... <laughs> Enough of them are. Enough of them are different. But basically... Um, we had to proofread these and tell them where, to, where they needed to make corrections. It was kind of interesting for us to say that to an architect. Then there is something called specifications. This is a multi-page, tedious to read document. It goes on for hundreds of pages sometimes. The, the, the who, how, when, where, and why <coughs> and don'ts of how you build this stuff and install it. It's very different than the specs you give to a printer. And then there's this wonderful process, and if any of you have gone through this, it's just delightful. It's, it's commonly known as QAQC, Quality Assurance, Quality Control. And you go through this to make sure that it all is correct. You'll notice different colors of pencil. There's a green one, there's a blue one, there's a red one. I think I was the blue one. Okay, Chris was the red one, our friend Jordan was the green one, and we would go through this, and as everybody went through it, we would cross-check each other, and we finally got it all done, we made it yellow, okay, that we had gone through the red, the green, or the, the red, the green, and the blue comments, cross-referenced them, this is a tedious process, then you have to sign these drawings. So you can see the signing on the uh, left side. Fourteen years later, okay? If you worked on a project for 14 years, could you keep that excited about it? You know, I'm sorry, you know, I don't do anything for 14 years and get as excited as day one. One thing that was kind of interesting about this is we were on the exact same schedule as the architects and the engineers. We, we, couldn't, we couldn't wait for them to, to make a decision. So they were changing their minds, and we had to catch up with them and we had like two days to do it. So towards the end of, of all of these stations, it got really crazy. Pretty nuts. So 14 years later, you know, a kid could be almost through high school at that point. Okay. So also keep in mind that because of that, that uh, us being on the same schedule as the architects, our drawings sat there for like five years, four years. Well, they built the thing. They had to build the thing before the sign companies could go in and measure the architectural conditions on site. So they, they, they <laughs> signage is a very uh, short lead item. And finally, this is what you get. There's a, that was your sidewalk cut. This is your building entrance. You know, graphics were incorporated sides were illuminated, they integrated with, this is the mezzanine, you circulate, all the sides are suspended on these cable systems. 
Here's where we broke the module and incorporated it into the wall system. Okay, it's a photo op. I thought this was a nice shot with this musician because most of the ones are like those guys that do Showtime. Okay. okay. <laughs> <coughs> the whole system began to work and as you maybe now when you go through a subway station you'll look at how many signs there actually are in there that there's so many they're kind of annoying but you can see this was on the grand opening day they actually put the, the bullets or dots on the trains themselves it's your logo <laughs> some other pictures we we found along the way. This is a nice one of an entrance at night. The graphics, you know, the fair, <coughs> the whole entering. There's no longer those, they call them the high wheel turnstiles, where I hate those things, where you get in and it squeaks and it's hard to push and it's a circular thing. Okay. Much more pleasant entry experience. Now I don't mind riding the subway. It looks clean, it's bright, it's well lighted. Yeah, and the art program is tremendous. Tremendous. And then down on the platform, basically, um, you know, platform edge signage on the uh, on the right hand side, left hand side, whatever. <laughs> Coming back to this thing, okay. This is mounted on one of the sidewalk cuts railing, but we don't have one of those. So where do you put it? Now you have to design another piece of stuff. Here's your hardware. We know the content, we got the graphics, now we have the hardware, all to accommodate a particular type of information. So that's the, so in the graphics program, we've got the content, which is the, the king, that's the bottom of the signage pyramid. Then you have the graphics and the hardware, and how that gets incorporated into a building, into a structure, requires a lot of teamwork. The team put together for this project hundreds and thousands of people. <coughs> stakeholders were tremendous. The delays, as you can imagine, some of the delays on the 2nd Avenue subway were from building entrances. <coughs> I don't want to give up so many square feet of rentable retail space to put it in a subway entrance. Negotiation after negotiation. Vent tubes, vent tunnels. You know, the sidewalk grates in the, in the, that you walk along and you feel that it comes up through the air. That all has to be vented from an engineering point of view. You have to get the air out of the station. But they do it with buildings now. Now they do it with buildings, and people say, well, I don't want that thing next to my building. I don't want that thing exhaust on my building. So, so. And go see the exhibition that Doug mentioned. Yeah. It's, it's really cool. If you haven't had a chance to see it, it traces from the very first drawings for signs incorporated into the stations all the way through to the current standards. Some of the globes you see there. It's a really a fascinating. They have some original drawings, which are great. Well, this one's pretty interesting. What came before Helvetic? There was nothing before Helvetica. <laughs> <laughs> nothing and, and, existed on the planet. And fortunately, we are not Helvetica haters, so, so we were able to do OK on this. So it's a never-ending saga. But one of the things we do is that I bring up the AA, the EE, the 19, the, the, you know, the J train, the G train, the L train, all of these things were in and out of service at one time. So what do you do with this stuff? There is a monstrous sign graveyard. Because you always have to change out the signs. If you make a simple change, you have now, what is it, the there's the, the W line is back or something <coughs> like that. Well, every sign that had a that didn't have a W now needs a W. And signs that used to you know have other train lines indicated all have to be changed out. This is an ongoing living process. So thank you. Thank you for inviting us. <laughs> And I, I, I'll meet you at the Broadway station. I love the one on the left. That was a I don't know where the Broadway is. Broadway. 
it's, it's t said with a true New York accent, right? Roadway. But the other one was a Times Square station when it was under construction. Yeah, it's the ACE train. Okay? It's not the ACE, it's the ACE train. Okay? So, um, what is again, thank, thank you for coming. It's really nice to see all of you people, and it's nice to, Doug, thank you so much. Sure, we can take some questions. Yeah, we got lots of, we got time. Yeah. Um, I think everybody had a collective gasp when we had, like, you announced it was 16 years um, that took a long to do this. Was that expected? Was that in your timeline? Or was that, is that longer than normal? That's pretty long. I think our expectations when we started was that this was supposed to be about a six or seven year project. And that was based on construction assumptions. You know, uh, that assuming there was going to be no legal challenges to right of way and property ownership, there's assumptions that, oh, we're going to dig a hole and nothing's going to happen. Okay, but then you get into different types of soil and engineering, etc. Uh, there's another project going on now that we started on many years ago called East Side Access. Okay, it's bringing Long Island Railroad into Grand Central. It's about, I think the original budget was like. Four billion. It's now something like twenty billion. Um, it was it, supposed it, to be done. It was supposed to open in what 2012, and it now it's going to be open in 2021. Okay, and it's because they're digging a hole that is 17 stories below grade. They're digging a hole big enough to put trains in. On, and I go. And, and, it, and these kind of major projects, you know, they're really unpredictable. What's going to happen when you start boring that tunnel through Earth? Yeah. So. Hope the tunnel don't collapse. <coughs> yeah. You mentioned um, the in-house team at MTA, and you mentioned the um, South Ferry Station. I'm curious. A, would the in-house team regularly have been the ones doing this? What brought you involved? Kind of what was that relationship as well? The engineering firms brought us on as as a consultant. They were looking for a consultant. And I think basically all four stations was just too much for station signage to take on at once. One station, maybe, but not, and I do think they did the South Ferry uh, station, but to do four at once, more or less at the same time, is pretty pretty difficult task. And it was a big coordination effort. You know, if you can control the entire design process and everyone on the team, you can work together. But this was different engineers and different architects and different people and uh, different stakeholders, different conditions for sign installation. And you know, it, in many ways, the the construction dictated how the station would look and how much room you had. So each station, is, well, the concept of a column-free station was intact. They're all a little different in terms of how they work. Yeah? Um, is there um, like a system for the braille signage? That, or is that something that's just placed based on the limitations of the space? Uh, well, it's a little bit of both. Uh, the ADA is very prescriptive as, to, as far as mounting heights and this and that. But in some cases, you can't, there's no place to mount a sign at that height in the subway system at a given station. So they've gotten some, some agreements in place to quote unquote break the rules if they need to, uh, to just get a sign there. I mean, that's, that's really the most important thing. But there are rules about the size of letters, <coughs> how far the letters need to be spaced. Um, how far away from the baseline of the type the Braille needs to be. Braille is all one size. There are no font sizes in Braille. Um, and as Chris mentioned, mounting heights and some of the sidewalk cuts, the railings, well, the, these, the ADA says you have to mount it at a certain height, say five feet, for example. The railing is only four. So you have to mount it where the surface is. So there are rules, but, you know, the, you have to just apply some common sense from time to time. Yeah. yeah. Did you have um, influence over the materials used for the signage, or was that prescription also by the MTA, and did it change during the 14 years that you were? <laughs> no, basically the sign panels are what they've always been, pretty much, which is porcelain enamel, which porcelain is steel, yeah. which is one of the most uh, durable 
I, you know, it's it's expensive too, uh, but it's super durable and it really looks great. I love the way it looks. Do they sell those old signs that are I think you can buy them on eBay and Etsy yeah. from people who've kind of stolen them. The porcelain on steel is now hard to find. <coughs> manufacturers that did that process have gone out of business or they have moved out of the country. Um, some of the newer stages, newer sign replacements, if you look at them, they are now painted as opposed to porcelain on metal. Or vinyl. Or they're even vinyl. Uh, vinyl was, early vinyl was discouraged because it chipped and cracked and you could peel it off. Now with the better adhesives and better vinyl material, it's, it's more accepted. Um, we're just finishing some work up at uh, Penn Station for <coughs> in anticipation of the Moynihan train hall opening up. Um, and we're having that as sort of painted this time, okay? Um, because we can't find manufacturers for porcelain and steel that can deliver the quantity within the price point that we have. You know, yeah. And, and all, a lot of it comes down to money. But to your point, did things change? Yeah, they, the manufacturing processes have evolved over time, but when we put the project out to bid, it had a particular spec for materials and manufacturing. And that was dictated. Yeah. Now, as far as the mounting was concerned, we used the stainless steel uh, headers and cables, which is not their standard way of doing things. Their, their standard way of doing things is much more straightforward. It's called Unistrut. And it's a structural system that's pretty, pretty basic. It's functional at its, at, with a capital F. Okay. Um, and they, they were fine. They, they let us do it. Because the stations were different. We couldn't use what was intended for one place in another place that didn't, it's not appropriate. The 7 train at Grand Central has some uh, signs suspended from wire. So you may want to take a look at it. <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, going back to earlier in the talk, you were showing um, sort of the ideas you had for ways to improve. Like you had the, the Q and the T that were louder on the building. You had the line maps on the, on the black signage. And I was wondering, how much of a case did you make to them to actually do this, or was it kind of dismissed immediately, and was that frustrating for you? Frustrating, yes. Um, I think every any designer that puts forth an idea on a piece of paper and puts something out, and somebody says, no, I don't like that, feels a little like, ooh, ah, no. Um, but the, you know, there were a couple of things that we, we pointed to as precedents. If you go to Times Square, some of the subways up there, twinkly lights and wavy lines and all of that. And we said, well, look, you're doing it other places. And the, the feedback was, yeah, but that's Times Square. You know, it's got to blend. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's got to blend. We <coughs> blend in a different way. Um, this is on the Upper East Side, don't forget. Yeah, the Upper East Side. Um, and the line maps, if you, from a... If you think about it from a maintenance point of view, we talked about how many signs you needed to change out if you changed a W to an R or something. How many line maps would you have to do on every station that had a map? But you know what's interesting? Most other systems do have line maps. Yeah, I love line maps. And they're very, very helpful, especially if you're unfamiliar with the system. So you know which station comes after you. Oh, it's five stops. Okay, now they have line maps in the subway cars. How cool, you know? So you already know where you're going. Yeah. And then, <laughs> you already know. Well, that way. Um, but there's also some other things in, in the subway system now that uh, you you see the countdown clocks on the platforms, the LEDs, and then now you see the you know display screens that you know, used for advertising, <laughs> also, you know, good service on the one, two, three, no delays. But if you look at them, the countdown clock says, next train, five minutes. You sometimes look at the one on the, the display, it says, next train, two minutes. Oh, please, let's get it together, <laughs> you know. And then they tell you things like, well, there's a train in five minutes, and next one's in 10 minutes, and next one's in 15 minutes, and next one's in 20 minutes, and next one's in... Are you gonna come? Are you gonna come back? Am I gonna wait for the twenty-minute train? No, I'm getting on the next one that comes. 
but it's one of these things that just because you can doesn't mean you should. Yeah, you could probably give the list of trains for the next month if you want, but what does that, the type of information that you're providing to the writer, you know, you have to look at it from a, to, to your common sense point of view, is that what are we giving the writer? What do they need to know? And when? when? And so, when do they need to know it? That's it's a really important question. So the technology <laughs> is there, and it's great technology. I mean, the, the information available now, there's, there's things on the platform you touch and get train information and, you know, get a menu or whatever you want. You know, it's, it's pretty interesting stuff. But I, it's what do you do with it and why? I also want to point out that at the MTA, there's two different separate groups. One deals with static signage, and that's station signage. And the other deals with digital signage. And and they they we got them to talk to each other. <laughs> but that you know, they really don't they don't coordinate they don't that much. They talk to each other, very much, you know. Um. And it's kind it kind of baffled us. We're kind of going, shouldn't you guys be talking more? Yeah. And then you get all of the uh, the there's so much information for the, the empty, you hear it all the time. We're five billion dollars in debt. We're fifty billion dollar capital program that we're going to do. <coughs> we haven't got any money. Okay, so they're doing everything they can with revenue generating. All the advertising, as opposed to one poster on the wall, you can now put thirty in one box, and it generates a lot of revenue. And you cover the entire subway car with ads, and you cover the inside of the subway car. With and, ads. and another interesting thing about New York, because we run the subway 24 7, that's why we don't have any ads on the track wall. If you go to Paris, London, any other city, Hong Kong, there's ads on the track wall. When the train pulls out, you have an ad that you're staring at. So, but they shut down at night. So you can change the ads. And so it's all about revenue generating. But we're the only system in the world that's 24-7, 365. Lucky old us. New York. Yeah, we're New York. We're in some way with balls. Yeah. So. Harriet, did you have a question? Oh, I was wondering. I think that those digital displays actually show the line map. Yeah. They do inside the train cars. I haven't seen them on. Yeah, the dashboards. Oh, cool. Oh, that's good. So the endless battle of what the subway map looks like is still raging. Yeah, yeah. Doug. How does the bureaucracy you went through for a job like this, which just seemed to require amazing persistence and patience, how does it compare to the other kinds of wayfinding jobs you have or projects you have? Is this the Everything else is a piece of cake. <laughs> <laughs> um, transit work is, there's a lot of bureaucracy. There's very key, important parts of transit work that you cannot ignore or neglect, and that's called safety, okay? Every bit of the station needs to be designed with passenger safety in mind. So if there are delays, if there are people, there's lots of people involved with, there's the people with fire egress safety. We had arguments about, everybody sees the sign in the station that says exit. What's it mean? That's how you get out. That's the exit over there. Now, Follow. that that word is is a scary word, scary word in transportation because, okay, where you see the word exit and we're trained to just go up those steps That's like crazy. Exit. That's how you get out. That's how you get out. But those are not fire shielded exits. They're not building code. They're not building code exits. So all of this stuff gets into play. So you get all of the people involved with safety, you get all the people involved with structures and engineering, you get all the people involved with you know, operations, how, how many people can we fit on the platform. And the, up, the upshot of it all was that all of those red exit signs, even though they're not actually technically fire code uh, enclosures, they all had to be permanently lit. So the new ones in the second amber subway are illuminated as well. Externally as, illuminated. Yeah, but they are illuminated on emergency lighting systems so that should it be a power outage that sign will be illuminated to get you out of the station still not necessarily a fire enclosed stairwell but at least you'll be able to find your way out and I mean we've argued in if you've traveled in a lot of different subways you know the sign says way out 
in, in England or exit it, to street. Or in Chicago, it just says out. Out. I go, that works. I understand that. Um, and I think, I think they avoid the word exit on purpose because of this problem. So the bureaucracy, to your, your point or your question, is there's, there's a lot of stakeholders involved, and it can really, you have to have patience. The, a lot of the stakeholders don't like each other. Um, we've done work with, with Amtrak and New Jersey Transit in the same room, and literally almost comes to fisticuffs. You know, jumping up and yelling at each other, foaming, you know, and yelling, you know <laughs> let's, let's get the trains to run on time, okay? Um, so there's a lot of back and forth between all the stakeholders. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I once read that there was one little sign shop in Crown Heights that is responsible for fabricating all of the signage for the whole city system. The I, I think it's kind of a myth. Kind, I, there is the Bergen Street sign shop, yeah. which which I, I think is kind of affiliated somehow with the MTA or New York City Transit. And they tend to make the stuff out of aluminum and vinyl. They don't do the porcelain enamel work because they're not set up to do it. But so yeah, there are, there is, the MTA does have their own manufacturing capabilities, but it's rather limited. You know, so um, they do what they can. They're, they do a lot of Band-Aid stuff, you know. Yeah, a lot of the kind of inter interim stuff yeah. they do. You'll notice on the stair risers, there's a P1. There's like a little label. Yes. Yes. It's, you know, platform, mezzanine. They're, you know, they're all coded. Every stair in the system has a little tag on it. That says, you know, it'll be like P101. It's, it's P1. P2, P3. Right, it enables each stair so that it's all part of maintenance. And right? that, that includes stairs both above and below the landing, which are numbered differently. They have a different prefix. Did you, did you have to spec? Well, we didn't want to do that. No. no. Leave that to somebody else. Yeah. Did, did this experience put you off um, jobs at the scale? I'm thinking of the imminent Port Authority assembly. Mm. Once they figure out what they're yeah. doing, I'm sure that will be boomed out of the last decade. Oh, probably. But, but what's Can interesting, the we, um, there's one thing about transit that's kind of fun and interesting and very, very satisfying is that on a daily basis, we help millions of people, okay? And that's kind of a good <laughs> feeling. Um, is it the most creative work? No. Not really. Okay, it, you know, it, it's black, it, you know, white type on black, okay. Um, but it's really in the service of the public good. And from 2nd Avenue Subway, we jumped to Amtrak Acela. And we did all of the Acela signage in all of the stations up and down the Northeast Corridor. We continue to do a tremendous amount of work with Amtrak and all of their stations across the country. We've done work with New Jersey Transit. We've done work with SEPTA. We've done work with uh, New York Waterways. Um, so uh, we do a lot of transportation work. It's and the East Side Access Project is, is a big one, too. Yeah. It's every bit as big as this one. Um, it's only one station, but it goes like five blocks. It goes from like 42nd Street to 48th Street, something like that, 47th Street? Uh, yeah, it goes, it goes a long way. <laughs> And, and uh, basically, um, you know, it's that project keeps on getting delayed too. They are putting finishes in, though. I did talk to the chief architect the other day. They are putting finishes in, They're putting tile in, and escalators and ceilings and lights. And, I uh, mean, but you know, you reach a point where you go, "I'm going to be 70 when that's over." Yeah. <laughs> you know, and but, it's kind of like, "Wow, yeah, that's weird." That kid will be out of college. Uh, <laughs> uh, but just as an anecdote to. Uh, how complicated signage and transportation can be. Uh, when we were working on east side access, there was a decision to add an elevator. I oh. like elevators. Great idea. Okay. One elevator takes up 30 square feet. Okay. We were asked to put in a proposal to, well, if we're putting in the elevator, we've got to have some signs for the elevator. They said, of course you do. But that elevator has a ripple effect 
up and down the entire station. When I put in the fee proposal for that, they said, why is it so expensive? We're just dealing with a small little square footage, and we're going, yeah, but this elevator's down by 42nd Street, and I've got to get to the signage all the way up at 48th Street. Everybody has to direct to that elevator. So, <coughs> on two levels. And so it, it has this tremendous ripple effect that just goes on and on and on. So, yeah, you have one elevator. I have to change the messages on 200 signs. Okay. okay. And that means going back to that message schedule. It's tedious. Making sure that every sign layout can accommodate that extra message. Do we need to make the sign bigger? So it's just this cascade of, of ripple effect that affects it all. It was interesting, too, with east side access. You, there's two levels of tracks, two levels of four tracks or something like that. And the way those tracks were numbered was really important because you only access them from the west. And the way the engineers had originally numbered them was that you hit the, the, the biggest number first and then it diminished as you headed east. You know, I want to come to number one first. I don't want to come to number four first. So, and, and they, they, they only partially revised it according to our wishes. Uh, so we ended up having to have two extra lines of type just to, to deal with, yeah. I, I mean, weird things like that that you would never think that have a ripple yeah. effect. But when I come in from the door on the left, you know, okay, so it, it, it's this entire <laughs> strategy, giving people information where they need it and when they need it. And information that makes sense to them. Yeah. So, I hope you enjoyed that. We did. Found it interesting. Thank you.